Good afternoon, members of the assembly, and, and thank you. Good thank afternoon. you for having me, allowing this opportunity. Uh, so I'm that, that representative from the law enforcement community, the, the other representative from the law enforcement community, let me put it that way. Um, but assembly uh, member uh, Gottfried, I want to say something about Netflix. If you want to prohibit something, prohibit Netflix. I, I may just get my wife back if that happens, so it's kind of personal. It's kind of personal, but so is the prohibition of marijuana when you, you know, all, all the information that you've heard here today and most recent, the reason for the prohibition of marijuana, social control. It's not going to happen. Social control. On that premise alone, it should be ended, despite everything else that we're here talking about today. So um, who do I represent other than myself? I represent an organization called LEAP, the Law Enforcement Action Partnership, an international organization of law enforcement professionals, thousands of members, current and retired members of the police community, prosecutors, corrections officials, federal agents, judges, and more. So just so you know, there are many of us out there that believe in ending these policies of prohibition for cannabis and other significant drug policy reform. Because we see the current picture of prohibition policies as a great detriment to public safety. Not just in this country, but on a global scale. And when you know, a, a, big, a big reason why we in the law enforcement community, many of the members that you here opposing this type of reform? There are many reasons, but a big one is the lack of education. And I'll get into that and some of the reasons why. But first of all, a little bit of background about me. I'm a 34-year law enforcement veteran from the state of Maryland, retired from the Maryland State Police. Most of my career was either in narcotics enforcement, criminal investigation, or training. I was actually the head of training of the two largest police departments in the state of Maryland at one time, Maryland State Police in Baltimore City. As it relates to my work in drug enforcement, yes, I worked undercover, and I even at one time commanded all the drug task forces for one half of the state. Total of 14 drug task forces I had under my command during my time with the Maryland State Police. When I was doing this work, I had not a clue about the history of the policies that I was enforcing. And I know that we weren't teaching it because, again, I was a commander of two of the largest police academies training divisions in the state of Maryland. And we don't teach that. We don't teach the foundation of the laws that we enforce. We just teach you how to go out and enforce the laws. Another position that I held uh, when I was at Baltimore City was the chief of human resources. Earlier it was talked about the policing incentives of going out and making the arrests, of writing the tickets, and that so-called busy work and, and why the police officers do it. Well, it's because the numbers that we bring in, the arrests that we make, unfortunately is part of the matrix that we use for evaluating police officers. And it's completely wrong. It's completely wrong. We should be evaluated on the absence of crime within our patrol sectors and the absence of police activity in making that happen. And in order for that to happen, you've got to have great relationships with the people that you serve, that you serve. Leadership is completely absent from the profession that I still love dearly. I've been out of it for seven years now as the executive director for the Law Enforcement Action Partnership. But I am still quite fond of the profession that I had chosen and I spent three decades in. Leadership is a big problem. And in a profession where we are absent the leadership that we need, 
in guiding the men and women and making the, the right decisions and, and becoming true servants of the community, there comes a time when you've got to change the laws that they enforce. And this is one of them. This law, these laws of prohibition, are the most problematic, it, it is the most problematic piece of public policy since slavery. And you've heard the data. I'm not, I, I, in, in my written uh, testimony, I speak to data. I'm not going to cover that. You've heard enough about the data. It's quite evident of the racial disparities and issues that follow this policy. And it has been occurring for a very, very long time. So again, the, the, the main reason that I'm here is to show you that there is a great and growing representation of the law enforcement community that is now supporting this policy change. I've been to every state where we now have a legal adult use market. I've been overseas to many of our European countries. I've been to the Netherlands. And what really pains me is this example. A couple of months ago, I gave similar testimony in the state of Illinois in front of their legislative body about the reasons they need to end the prohibition of marijuana in their state and move into a regulated market. And testifying after me was a member of the law enforcement community, a chief of police, who talked about the problems with the legal market in the state of Massachusetts and Maine. <laughs> They're not even up and running yet. It, it's just been passed. But he had talked to police chiefs that told him how problematic it was. He then started talking about the problems in the streets of Denver, in the smoke-filled streets where the children are walking, and had never been. I have. And it's not so. As it relates to Amsterdam, where they've been, had a, have had a, a de facto legalization, at least for the authorized coffee shops for, for many years now, let me tell you, that's one of the cleanest cities I've ever been in. It's one of the safest cities I've ever been in and friendliest cities I've ever been in even though the only other people of color that I saw happened to be there on the same conference I was at. But still, the people were extremely friendly. And very seldom did I see a police officer patrolling around. I think I saw two for the week I was there. And the only time I got a whiff of any uh, marijuana burning was when I got curious and stuck my nose into the door of one of the coffee shops. The lies that are circulating of, from, uh, around those and among those who want to keep things the way they are is quite alarming. And it's disturbing to me when that type of testimony, and I say testimony, I'm not talking about water cooler talk or, you know, in a restroom and you're just chatting and you know how folks get. No, testifying before folks like you and to hear this coming from my comrades is quite disturbing very disturbing. But I think that tide is changing and our organization is doing its best to make certain of that. I want to just touch on a, I'm not going to be long, I just want to cut, touch on a, a key, couple of key points here um, to, to reemphasize some things. There's a couple of things that have been said here today. As you move into this place of a regulated market. And believe me, I've seen firsthand the devastating effects upon black, brown, and poor communities regarding these regressive laws. We do have to ensure that the opportunities exist as we move this marketplace from one of illegality to a place of legality we do have to ensure that the opportunities exist for those who have been affected negatively by these reg regressive policies. As the, as the gentleman before me testified, you've got to restore 
the ability, the rights to those people who have been arrested, who have been charged, who have been convicted with possession and even distribution charges so that they can partake in the change in this industry. I want to speak from a place of public safety because that's where I work. That's where I'm from. Right now, this market that exists is in the shadows. The shadows are very dangerous, they're very problematic. In what I have written, you'll see some figures regarding 246 metric tons of illicit marijuana, which is consumed every year in the state of New York. Now, that's a mild estimate. It's, I guarantee you it's a lot more than that. 246 metric tons equates to over $3 billion in commerce, which is being traded illegally. You know, that goes into the hands of our, 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 our criminal organizations, organized crime, the cartels. The cartels continue to establish more and more footprint throughout our country. Moving this industry into a place of legality, here's what it does for our kids. The number one sought after employer for the current illicit market is our young people. It is our kids. And when I'm talking about this, I'm not just talking about marijuana, I'm talking about other drugs too. But they go after our kids for a number of reasons. They're easily influenced. When they do get arrested, consequences aren't as severe, even though for that child they are severe. Kids go to school, and they carry what they're selling with them to school. When you move into a legal and regulated market, just like in Colorado, there are no children behind the counters selling marijuana. They're adults. Children aren't even allowed in the stores. There are no children coming in to buy. The people who are selling marijuana are not selling other drugs as well. So there is no upselling. There is no giving of a sample of, of heroin or something else. Try this. Let me know how you like it. It's free. None of that occurs in a legal regulated market. The violence that follows the illicit drug trade in our streets and in our neighborhoods is tremendous. I'm from Baltimore. I grew up in Baltimore. I live there now. We will be nowhere near over 300 murders in Baltimore if it weren't for policies like this. Guaranteed, and I know. But on the other side of that coin, as we make the needed changes in this country, you've got to go back and replace that Put it this way. Unfortunately, the number one single employer in Baltimore is not Walmart. It's a drug trade. Pays a lot of bills. Pays the heat, keeps the lights on, buys school clothes and school books and food. We've got to replace that economy. So we just can't end the prohibition of marijuana and forget about those communities. You've got to go back in with the resources that you're going to save, which are going to be, it's going to be quite a bit, you've heard those numbers today, and you've got to devote the time, resources, and energy to those families that are left in those communities. You've got to make that happen. In closing, I believe I've got so much more, and maybe you've got some questions, but in closing, let me talk a little bit more about policing and this tool that we currently have where there's a great void of police leadership. This tool of being able to stop and search any and everybody I so choose under the premise that I smell marijuana. There doesn't even have to be an odor.